Perfect. Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, this first presentation uh, I prepared. Uh, so just to start off, uh, I think um, it's going to be quite long, maybe an hour. So if you're tired, just let me know. We can have a break. That's one thing. And, you know, if you just want to drop off, just drop off. That's fine. Um, and this uh, presentation, uh, so that's the title of it. So basically, I want to show uh, Rust um, by example. So I have these two crates I've written, which are relatively trivial. And I won't be focusing on uh, on the code. Uh, actually, can you see the slides? Because I'm not sure if that can be this. Oh, yeah, OK. So, uh, so basically, I don't want to focus on the, the logic of the code because it's not really relevant here. Uh, what I want to show is basically what makes a Rust, uh, uh, Rust program, Rust library, and Rust uh, binary um, command line program. So this will be like a, a 10,000 foot view on programming in Rust. And I won't go much into details of everything I'll be talking about because you know there's just not enough time. Uh, I want to just give you kind of high level glimpse of um, what makes a Rust program. So, uh, uh, so again, if you have any um, questions, uh, I can always clarify. So please ask. And if you cannot, you know, if you're kind of not following along, uh, you want me to uh, uh, talk about something in the previous slides again or something like that, please let me know. I'm happy to uh, explain a bit more. That's all okay. I don't know. I can see. Right, I'm assuming it's fine. So um, yeah, let's go. So um, these two crates are basically um, related um, to um, a thing called an autonomous uh, system number database. So uh, basically, internet uh, is constructed of uh, smaller networks, and each network has an autonomous system number assigned to to this network. Um, which is then used uh, in the um, border gateway protocol, which basically uh, ties up all the routing information in the internet, right? So um, this is quite uh, useful for, for my work, effectively, because I, I, I manage a website and it's uh, good to know where the traffic is coming from. So there is this website, uh, IP to ISN, uh, and it's a, a freely published data file that contains information like uh, uh, IP address uh, range. So for instance, if there is a block uh, like this, uh, all the IPs within, within that block belong to the company called Level 3, uh, which is from US, and has this AS number assigned to it. So that basically this. So that two crates I've written are the, the, the D1 is the library that can read this um, file from that website and index it and uh, allows you to look up a record in it. And the tools is basically uh, two command line tools that uh, one is to download the database and index it on the local um, file. And the other one is to execute lookups. Um, so I can go to a quick demo. Um, I've also written a post about that on my blog recently, um, just to start off my blog with something uh, relatively easy, it basically goes through uh, uh, how I use it in my work to uh, process uh, access logs uh, to add this information onto them, and then how I use the, 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 the command line tool to uh, basically um, block or verify that some networks are, you know, blocked networks and block them. Uh, so let me do a quick demo of the tool. So. So in Rust, you can run, uh, well, there are actually didn't install it. So anyway, so yeah, actually I probably have ISN. So that command uh, allows you to look up uh, an address. So for instance, you just give it like that. And you can see that um, uh, this belongs to some what? computer information center. OK, that's weird. Let's go uh, 8888. Should be that belongs to Google, etc. So that's how you basically use that, uh, that command line tool, right? It has some other features and flags, but that's not very important. Um, 
Uh, okay, so that's that. Um, so Rust crates. So I'm using word crates. Basically, in Rust crates means something uh, similar to uh, like uh, Jam in Ruby or Pip in Python or whatever in any other language, right? So it's basically a way to uh, formalize and then uh, distribute uh, libraries and binaries um, for the given language, right? So you can install them, you can uh, make them a dependency, etc. So uh, in Rust, you have basically two types of the crates, but there are some more, but that's not important. The main, main ones is a binary crate, which contains executables that you can build and run. And the other one uh, is the library, which doesn't contain any executables, just uh, just some reusable Rust uh, code to use in another crate, effectively. A binary crate can also contain library code, uh, which is, in my case, uh, just for one function, but it's just a way to share uh, functionality between uh, the two binaries, right? Um, so in general, like uh, every Rust project, um, will contain this uh, cargo.toml file, which describes the dependencies uh, for cargo to know what, what, what to also need to fetch and build, and also other metadata, so I'll show that. Um, so it contains usually the, the package block with the name of the, the crate, its version, authors, and other metadata. And then the very important section is the dependencies, uh, like all the other crates, uh, that this library will be using and their versions. Note that those versions are actually in the semver format, which means that uh, Cargo is, for instance, for this one, is allowed to install version uh, 1.5 or greater, but not 1.1, 1 .1, uh, which is considered incompatible, uh, kind of by, by convention, right? So uh, that's quite important because you know you have to you, if you adhere to you should adhere to this especially if you are making libraries because otherwise you can break people's code uh, very easily by just uh, you know incrementing the wrong bit of it right also if it starts with zero then it's kind of alpha experimental which this one is I could probably release version one to be honest for this search. Uh, and then obviously, uh, so normally you would add this um, dependencies here, but I, I often use a cargo add command, which is pretty nifty because you just give it the name of the crate and it automatically adds it with a proper version, the latest version to your dependencies. So I recommend checking this out. So you can get that command by installing cargo edit uh, kind of package. Okay, um, now, uh, so Cargo lets you do various things with your project. So um, uh, so Cargo Check, for instance, just runs a compilation of all the dependencies on your crate and your crate verify um, it type checks. And it doesn't generate any uh, binary artifacts, which makes it um, the fastest way to basically verify that everything is fine. Uh, well, Cargo Build allows you to build the project uh, artifacts, and by default, it builds in them with a kind of in a in a debugging mode, which uh, is slower but produces more useful stack traces and has some extra checks. Uh, but with minus minus release, you can uh, build the final artifacts for you to to deploy. So the, those artifacts usually uh, gonna end up in our uh, target. Uh, release or debug actually i have only debug but doesn't matter um if i build it with race actually that's a library so it doesn't have it uh, if you go to the, the command line tools then if you look at so look at it release then there is this two executables i can just run effectively right uh, so that's that um you can use cargo run which is very uh Handy to to basically build and test your your command like this. Um, and the final one is if I go back to SMDB, car cargo test runs your unit tests uh, and also document tests that are also if your documentation contains a blocks of Rust code, it will um, compile those and and try them. You know, 
uh, so that uh, all your documentation has also valid code in it. I'll talk more about this later. Um, so let's go to the source code. I may use this view or we'll see how this goes. Can you see this or? Can... Yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, so, okay, let me go back for a second. So apart from the cargo tunnel file, uh, which is describing uh, the crates and its dependencies, usually have the, well, pretty much always have the source file, uh, source directory, and uh, in this you have uh, your um, your source code effectively. So this one only has the libres, and the libres is the kind of entry point to the library uh, module. So every file uh, also constitutes a module. You can have more of them, and they will be different modules of your library, but the libres will be the kind of main one. Uh, for binaries, I'll, 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 I'll show you later uh, how that looks like. Um, so every module uh, can have a documentation block, which is using kind of exclamation mark, uh, kind of code block syntax. And within that block, you can uh, use markdown to write documentation. So you can see it's the standard kind of markdown syntax. And you can also put code snippets, which will be compiled and tested with tests. And uh, basically, this lets the, by just doing that, uh, when you publish your crate, it's going to be picked up by uh, a website called um, docs.rs, um, and it will render a nice page for you. And there is also a cargo.doc command, which you can use to generate a similar HTML, basically, and test things how they look. Uh, before you push it out. Uh, so as you can see, this, these two things are corresponding, right? So um, you get nice documentation, which is in line with the code. Mm. Okay, um, going further. So uh, in Rust, you can also document every item. So this is a, a struct called record. And if you use three slashes, um, it becomes a documentation for, um, for that. Uh, so if we go here to record, you can see already this text here, and you can see this uh, in here. You can also use a block format of that and put, you know, more lines for, for the description, like you can see, and it's also markdown, so you can put examples and things like that, as you can see in the standard library documentation, which is, which is built exactly the same way. Um, and also each, like, field or function can have their own documentation strings and they will render nicely like in here and you can see that this function which is part of the record uh, also gets this here so it's pretty handy and nice um, uh, let me go back here um, and finally you obviously have comments which are just up two slashes let me find a comment uh, like this and these are not rendered uh, anywhere so only in the source code so you can um, you can leave. So here I left some to-do notes for myself, uh, as you do. Um, okay, import. So the next thing you will see on the file, uh, on the module file, is uh, all the imports. Uh, so um, the idea in Rust is that whatever you use in the module, um, it has to be imported, um, so that you can easily or defined in here. So record is defining here, but um, some things, uh, obviously, just some things that are given for from standard library by default for you, like in the standard library prelude. But you can also look this prelude up and see what's in there exactly and what things are coming from. And the idea is that once you see something in the code, you don't have to think too much uh, in order to find it because you will see, oh, okay, it's in, it's it's imported here and from that crate. And the, so you do that by basically using the use keyword. The first thing is the crate um, you're importing from. So these are all external crates that I have in my dependencies uh, in the, the cargo tunnel, right? And uh, you can also use standard library things that are outside of the prelude. So there are parts of standard library that are not available by default, and you have to actually explicitly import them with this. Uh, with this. Um, and this basically works like from bit code, I'm taking two functions into here. So when I use the serialize from and serialize into, it's actually coming from the bin code. Um, 
I can take this struct from IP net or is it a nano? But anyway, this 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 thingy and this type and this type, etc. So it's pretty straightforward. You can also use star, uh, which basically means give me everything that's public in that crate, uh, which can be quite dangerous if that crate would implement like add some uh, type that conflicts with yours, your code will stop, stop compiling. So it's not really recommended to use that unless they are kind of preloaded types, like in this case, I guess it's, it's fine. Uh, um, so that's that. Also by default in Rust, everything that is in your module is private by default, which means it cannot be imported in another module. So for this reason, you have to use this kind of pub Thingies, um, which basically are visibility kind of class specifiers, and they say that yes, this can be used outside and it's a part of the public API. And you know, you have to think twice if you want to change something there because you will make things incompatible. But you can also make uh, you something that you didn't create, like IPv4 net, to be exported as it's coming from your crate, which is useful when you return those types to client, uh, basically meaning that this becomes your part of your public API and it's a responsibility for it to be compatible as well. Um, so if you go to uh, here, I can see that this is, these two things weren't created by me, but they look like part of the, the API of this library and they have their own documentation, um, but it's not my code actually. Um, something that I returned with. So that's, that's that. Um, is everything clear for now? I is there? Think so is there any way to import a binary that's already compiled? Like, uh, like this? No, so all of this is managed by Cargo. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem in Rust, right? So in Rust, when you build a project, you often end up with like 300 dependencies and it takes ages to build initially. And there is no like a binary format uh, for Rust that you just drop in like a DLL or something and it magically works. So there's nothing like that. Also, the I know that the binary like ABI, the binary kind of interface of Rust kind of artifacts is not uh, standardized, which means it's subject to change and therefore you should not depend on it. So the short answer, I think it's no, you can't, you have to have a source code. Well, okay. obviously if it's a C library, you can wrap it, etc., and it doesn't have to have a source code for it. But yeah, for anything Rust for now, as it stands, you do. Um, there is, I think there is some special types of crates that are like for procedural macros, which kind of have this kind of idea, I don't know. But in general, no, you have to, you have to have a source code. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's continue. So the next thing I have on this file, um, so usually after, after, um, after this, I will define any uh, global uh, variables if I have, so, if I have those. So um, the idea here is that in Rust, global variables are all uppercase and you need to use const. And the idea is that they are baked into the image of the binary. So they are read-only, uh, so you cannot mutate them. Um, and in this case, I um, I just uh, put two kind of tags that I use uh, when I'm serializing a file to disk to kind of mark the version of this and mark this, uh, that this is the file that I'm going, when I'm going to be loading, I'm just going to verify these two tags are present. Just, you know, so I don't try to load uh, uh, something that's not database file. Um, and you can notice that while I'm using kind of as, as an, uh, string literal, uh, which are, um, uh, I'm not actually using this B modifier, which makes it to be represented as bytes. And therefore that's why I have this um, eight bit uh, unsigned integer uh, four times slice uh, of this string because I'm gonna be writing bytes to the file, so I already converted it into bytes this way without having to, without having it being a string actually. And also on the note of that, um, string literals like that in Rust are UTF-8 encoded by default and whole source code is also UTF-8. 
Mm, and all the dynamically allocated strings are also with the FX, so you have to kind of keep that in mind. If you need to work with uh, special characters, you can just put them there and they should just work uh, in theory. And also um, the idea with the, the const being, um, you cannot assign, you cannot run functions uh, in Rust uh, to to generate these values for cons, but basically the idea is to prevent is to avoid uh, something called in C plus plus and C life before main, uh, uh, kind of to make it only. And so so the programmer cannot do stuff before the main is executed really. So, but there there is a way to actually have um, have uh, something uh, initialized at runtime because sometimes you really need to. Uh, for this, there is a lazy static uh, macro, which is uh, another um, crate that uh, basically gives you a closure that is run on the first access. Uh, so it's still not before main, but it's initialized at the first use, uh, which can be handy at times. Um, so that's that. Mm. Uh, type in Rust. So, uh, so just the next thing I have here is a definition of a struct. Uh, so I'm going to go a bit about the types. Uh, so Rust have, um, being a low level language, has a, a primitive types that are uh, that can be used like directly in this like CPU registers. Um, obviously, for some platforms, there might be emulations. If you have 64 bit integer uh, and you have 32 bit platform, then there will be some emulation done, but for, for you automatically. Uh, but the general idea is that these primitives are what the CPU normally runs with. Um, and the idea in Rust is that, unlike with uh, C or C++, uh, the, those primitives are very specific. So if you say U32, it means unsigned 32-bit integer. And it doesn't depend on the platform. It, on every platform, it's unsigned 32. Uh, same with like a Sun 64, if it's even a 32 or 8-bit platform, it still behaves like a 64-bit uh, uh, variable, right? Uh, the only exception for this, so for instance, in C and C++, you have int, it can be long int, and long int can be dot or can be something else depending where you compile it. Uh, in Rust, there is no such a case. The only exception for this is the U size type, which is... Uh, size of a word depending on the platform and that's actually useful for the case where you have um, for instance accessing arrays and the length of the arrays cannot uh, exceed the the address space right uh, anyway so then it's using the native um, sizes of the bytes but they are only used in some cases like when you are indexing an array for instance or iterating or something like that um, so normally you would be using like uh, U32 is open or something. Before moving, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? So, yeah. if we use U size, uh, obviously, if we are going to use it, cast it into like U8, mm -hmm. we have to do it explicitly. Is it done yes. in runtime by some other code? Like, because like this is from someone who only use like scripting languages. So is there some, some sort of extra bit of code that does it or is it done yes, yeah. in the system? Yeah, so Rust basically uh, handles those conversions using trait system. So if you go to standard library and like look for, um, uh, for primitives, then you will see they implement a bunch of traits and those traits are responsible for doing uh, doing those conversions, right? So it's going to be here or be here. And there's going to be a lot of, uh, basically a lot of traits implemented, like bit ands and bit ors and everything. So everything in Rust is going through this trait system and also is the from uh, and then different conversions, right? So in general, it's not a function call because they are all kind of going to be inlined, right, and optimized. But it is something that uh, that the CPU will have to do. So we have to load this and maybe bit mask it to be 8-bit or I don't know, depending on the details on the compiler. Uh, but yeah, there will be. And also, uh, so Rust by default, if you try to assign a 32, 
U32 to U8, it will, so Holland, uh, the types don't match, right? So you can uh, use various methods to actually convert. One is using the AS keyword, uh, which will truncate by default, uh, which might not be what you want. Uh, but there are those as well uh, that are defined in those traits, like you can basically um, um, try to co concatenate, uh, like try to convert, and if it's bigger than the target, then it will return an error and, you know, different things and different, uh, like you can do it with, uh, what you call it, um, saturated uh, ads and stuff like that. So it's all, all there in those standard libraries, so have a look. But in general, yeah, so uh, you're gonna have to you're gonna get some code that, that does it actually, but it's gonna be minimal, you know, it's not, nothing to worry. Thank you. Okay, so other types um, from primitives are structs. So this is an example of a struct, and this is a, um, so it's like with any other language, pretty much you have all the fields and that struct has, uh, can have every combination, the value of it can have every combination of those values in those fields. Um, uh, which is basically called the product type in some kind of type theory thing. Um, uh, also supports tuples, which basically is the same as struct, but it doesn't have a name and the fields don't have names. They're just uh, like parentheses and you can access them by either the structuring or by using a kind of numerical indexes like underscore one, underscore two, actually just dot one, dot two, dot three. Um, and then there is another variant which is called name tuples, uh, which I think I have. I think the DB object is a name tuple. The idea here is that you do have a name for it, but the fields are unnamed, uh, which is useful if you only wrap in one thing and it's mostly of a wrapper kind of type. And there is this um, um, pattern where you basically have to wrap a type to give it some other properties than it would normally have. Um, and it's called new type pattern, uh, which is, I think, imported from Haskell. Uh, so these are the kind of things you would normally as expect. Uh, but Rust also has enums, uh, which are of a some type uh, kind of type. Uh, and these are more exciting for me, especially uh, coming from uh, Ruby or C, uh, where you don't have them. And the idea here is that the type can have one of the, the variants, but it's only one of any moment in, in time. So, sorry, the value can have one of the variants, right? So in this case, it's an error type and it can either be TSV error or a field parser or input parser, but, but not all of them at the same time like with the struct. Um, and in order to create one, so this you can basically um, write, uh, so to create them, you basically use the variant name as a kind of constructor and put a value in there. And in order to access them, you use kind of match pattern, which I'm not going to be explaining too much today. But uh, the idea is that if self is one of those, if it's this pattern, then the code execution will follow here. If it's that, and etc. So uh, match expressions are very powerful in Rust. You can even do slices of arrays these days, and um, you know things like you would normally do in Haskell, where you just you know take it tail of something and the head of something, etc. So it's pretty, pretty powerful, but that's a different presentation I, I did before. And it's, it's a sort of topic on its own. So let's not go there, but uh, some sometimes are pretty cool. And obviously in Rust, um, mm, well, maybe not that obviously, but in Rust functions and closure are first class objects, which basically means that the function can get a, fun a function as an argument or a closure. And a closure is a kind of, kind of special ad hoc function that um, can access variable from, variables from its own um, in context. Um, and that's how they are basically use this kind of syntax to create them. And they don't have a name, they don't have a, um, they do have a type which is anonymous, but they, they don't have a name as well. You can, you can assign them to variables though, and you can pass them around and they're pretty um, powerful. Okay. Um, so more a bit about functions, methods, and traits. Uh, uh, yeah. What? Sorry to but what about unions like C? Right. So there is. Uh, uh, yeah. So there are enums like C as well, uh, which also just use enum, but you can assign like uh, equals one and two, and they don't have they don't have values, right? They don't. They cannot carry values. They just um, effectively like integers with names. So yes, you can use those as well. 
uh, which is very handy when you use uh, when you try to wrap a C library or tech talk to C API. Uh, but in general, you don't use them much in Rust. Um, so another thing I didn't mention is that, yeah, which um, for me, <laughs> but definitely not for you guys, is that unlike C enums or like C sharp enums, uh, which are effectively just integer with named numbers, uh, these uh, variants can actually contain data of different types. So the TSV error can contain, it contains an uh, error type and this variant contains a different, actually it's a set of types, right? So it's a tuple kind of thing. Um, and uh, so, so, so they have, um, every variant can have different types. And the idea is that the value of this enum in the end is as big in like bytes, byte-wise as the biggest variant. So all of these variants can be represented in, in this memory location plus a tag, which is a number that is not accessible for you. It's like a, a implementation detail that basically the compiler uses to see, oh, if it's number one, then it contains this type and this variant, right? And with this type. Uh, if it's number two, it contains that. So that's how it's done. In so they are also called target, target enums, I think. It's a, it's a from C++. Um, Does that uh, answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah. So again, this is um, this is for me one of the killer features of this language. And um, also, you know, if you're coming from Haskell or from other functional programming languages, this is something you expect to get as well. Um, all right. So functions. So uh, Rust supports a concept of a free function, which is a function that is not attached to any type. It's just there and you can call it. So this one has a lot of type parameters which I'll explain later, but in general, and if you go to the documentation, yeah, it's just a function here, right? You can call it and you can import it. So for instance, uh, I'm importing three functions from the bin code binary uh, crate, which is for serialization and uh, you can just use them. So for some languages, like, I, I'm, I'm mentioning that because some languages like Java doesn't have a concept of a free function. Everything has to be an object. And that's not the case in Rust. Um, okay. Um, here. Um, and then obviously we have methods and, and none of the functions attached to into types. So let me kind of find something, some example. All right, so uh, DB is another struct. Uh, I've said it says a tuple, st uh, tuple struct. Uh, and DB has, um, uh, there, there are basically two type of uh, methods. Uh, one that is a method like in C++, which you can in, uh, invoke using the kind of dot, so data dot write. Uh, and those basically as a first argument take self. And self is like this in C++ or other languages. Basically, it's a reference to the into the one on which you 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 invoke the dot operator, right? So, in, in, for write, it will be DB data, and there are three variants of those. Uh, so you don't have to give it a type where you have in other cases, because it's going to be the type of self, um, which is in this case the type of the the, the DB, right? And uh, they can be either. A, a, references or mutable references or uh, just a the object itself in each case and when you call it it's its ownership is moved into its method which is a bit weird but it's kind of a powerful concept as well um, now there is also uh, methods that don't take self which you just call um using kind of dot dot like like in here so this is an example of, of how you would call a new uh, method that doesn't take self. And these are like a bit like static methods in other languages. The idea is that um, they are usually in Rust used to construct the, the objects. So in Rust, there is no such a thing as a constructor where it has some specific name. There is just a convention that uh, there will be a method without taking self that just returns uh, that given object. Um, and by convention, it's called new. But here I don't have new, I have 
from TSP and, uh, and another is load. So these two basically can construct DB in two different ways. And that's that basically. Um, uh, what else? Uh, okay, so um, the other way you can add, add methods uh, to your type is by implementing traits. Um, so I'm just going to show you very quickly. Um, I don't know, for instance, uh, the way to do it is that the basic, uh, I'll talk a bit more about traits, but um, actually maybe I don't know. Uh, so the way to do this is basically you say you are implementing a trait for a record and then you are giving a, an implementation of a function that this trait uh, requires, right? So for instance, uh, where I have this? Oh yeah, so this is actually um, trait or. So traits are basically a way to say, um, in order for this uh, type to have some properties, uh, you need to implement those functions, right? And there are two types of functions in traits. Ones are that are that don't have an implementation, like it's ending with a, a semicolon here, which means that if you want to implement or, you need to provide the implementation for this compare function. But there are also those that have a default implementation. In this case, you have this kind of notion in the documentation, which means that you don't have to implement this and it's gonna get some default implementation for you. Uh, but you may implement it if you want, so you may still implement it and give it a different implementation, um, which is yeah, which is obviously a handy. Uh, so traits can be used to um, add a lot of functionality to your um, type uh, by basically you providing some essential functions for the rest of the functions to use, and you get the rest for free, uh, which is a bit like modules in Ruby, let's say, um, or even a bit like inheritance, but not really. Um, uh, so, uh, for the traits, does it only have to be with functions? Like, can I say it has to have a field called X and Y? No, so the traits only contain functions. They don't contain any data. And this basically solves this problem of uh, you know what C++ has with you know this diamond shaped inheritance and you know what's like slicing and all this um, complexities uh, and basically if you want if you need this kind of thing like oh I need X for uh, a kind of blank uh, like a default implementation for another trait function so I don't know I want to I don't know move left kind of function let's say move left needs to have X on the self right then you basically, what you do instead, you uh, require an X function to be implemented for that type. And the rest is just gonna go call X and then do whatever. Um, so then um, when you're implementing it for like, I don't know, movable object uh, struct, you basically, your implementation will be kind of trivial. Like X uh, implementing of X is just returning the, you know, self.X. Uh, Etc. And that's how you how you do about it. The the bonus thing with that, the nice thing with that is that if your object doesn't have X but like calls it something different, then it still works, right? Because you can use different implementation for um, the the X method, right? Do you follow this? So it, yeah, yeah. So it's like uh, you kind of have a wrapper, like a getter. Yeah, exactly, a getter, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you require, your traits requires a getter to be implemented and that rest of the, the trait default implementations use the getter to access the data. Uh, but the trait itself cannot have data associated with. It only gets data associated with the moment you implement it for a particular type or data structure. Cool, thank you. Okay. Um, so that covers this. Um, generics. So as we know, generics are quite useful, uh, especially in uh, statically typed languages. Um, uh, so Rust supports uh, quite, you know, uh, a range of um, uh, things related to generics. Uh, so by um, so to give you just an example, um, you 
put generics in this kind of bracket form. So a function ca can be generic. This is a generic function, uh, but also data types can be generic, right? Uh, I don't think I have an example of the type, but in general, you can attach this and you can use this um, after later some other types. Uh, actually, I can show you a generic type here. Um, generic option. So option is an enum, which is generic over T. And uh, one of its variants, some uh, returns, uh, contains a value of T. And that T can be anything. It can be basically, actually, usually anything that uh, you can represent in REST as a, as a type. Um, so that's that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, so the idea is that this generic value is um, resolved at the call site, right? So when you use the read as NTSV, the value of R is established based on uh, basically what's passed. It's inferred, usually it's inferred, but you can also uh, use the syntax to tell it uh, exactly what you want it to be. Um, so the other thing you can do, um, like option works with everything, like every type, uh, this function will only accept R to be something that also implements a read trait. So something you can read from effectively, uh, which basically limits uh, the different types you can pass to it. It's only types that implement read. But these read types, uh, you know, there are many types that implement read, like file or socket can be read from, right? For instance. And these are actually parameterized. Another thing, which is the CSV reader, um, which is the thing that actually does the reading of the CSV format. That I use here. Um, do you follow this? I think so. Yeah. So, so functions and uh, types uh, can be parameterized and um, with, with different types effectively. And this can be also limited to some certain types of it. So uh, the very the, the thing is that um, when you have like an option that takes anything um, you cannot uh, sorry that's a different one you cannot call any methods on the value because you don't know what methods it has because it can have any methods this can be any type but if you use like if you bound um, a trait uh, to this parameter then you can use every method that is in the read trait on the value of r which effectively lets you, yeah, which makes it useful for something. Um, so that's another way kind of how it works. So uh, you can also list more than one trait. And uh, uh, so if you want to have something that is movable uh, uh, to be passed to function uh, move left, right, then you basically say that the parameter M or O uh, has to implement a movable trait or something like that. And then um, you can call things related to movement, I don't know, something like this. Um, so anyway, um, there is another um, way to use generic types and it's using the input uh, syntax. So um, the idea is that this thing basically says that the function returns a type that implements iterator, but it doesn't say the name of the type because the name of the type in, in some cases is A, not important, uh, or B, is even impossible to, to name. The problem is that uh, if you use closures, the closures are the, the sugared as structs, as types, uh, but they have no names. They, their names are anonymous. So if, you're, if a closure is part of your type for generics, then you cannot name the type. So this is why they invented the info uh, way of returning. So basically this function returns something that implements iterator and that's all that's all that's known about it. Uh, and that iterator, you know, it's some sort of a record uh, item uh, or an error. Uh, also to note uh, that uh, lifetimes which are used to track um, when something goes basically out of scope or when something cannot be accessed anymore and um, are also generic parameters in the sense that they are also determined uh, based on the, the call site of, so where the function is used um, and they parameterize the function uh, based on where it's used 
and uh, we use this kind of annotation to um, to name them. So sometimes you can you can skip uh, naming uh, lifetimes, but they are always there with any time you use a pointer. Uh, sorry, a reference to um, to something. It always have a lifetime. It's just maybe unnamed, but you can name them this way, and then you can say that. And you can you can see that the iterator returned also contains something that references something from from the reader, which means that you first need to finish iterating before you can drop the reader. Otherwise, compiler will say, "Oh wait, there is some something used in here, right?" So that's that, that's how you you define this. Um, I don't want to go much into lifetimes because it's another topic as well, right? So I don't have any questions so far. The question, but maybe a clarification is like uh, basically if the compiler doesn't understand how long some value should be kept in memory, it will just yeah. give you an error. Uh, so you have to be explicit about everything. So that's one thing about Rust that I found that everything has to be explicit. It's yeah, the same so thing with the return types. Like if you know that something that's coming out of that function is an iterator that you can trust that it will have certain functions. Yes, all the functions that iterator trait has. Yeah, so uh, that's a, that's a, that's an important uh, fact. So the idea is that uh, a function has, like only by looking at the signature of the function, um, there is nothing in the body of the function that can uh, that can effectively change anything in that signature in a way. So only by looking at the signatures, you know that the function does type check with given context or doesn't, irregardless of its content, which is quite a handy property, but then it also requires you to specify everything exactly on the signatures. But then also means that you rarely need to specify any types in the body because they usually can be inferred from the signature, right? So from the parameters that go in and then go out uh, of the function. Um, for instance, I think in Haskell, you may not define types on the functions and then sometimes they depend on the body and it might be, I don't know, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I heard that can be can be problematic if, if you don't do that. It's a best practice to do it as well, even if you don't have to. Um, so yeah, that's a good good mention. And also for lifetimes, as I say, they they are always there. There are some rules that the Rust used to uh, call elision uh, rules. I'm not sure the language, but uh, the idea is that there are some rules that you can skip um, naming lifetimes, uh, but they will be assigned uh, with those rules. So they they you, you, you really know what's going to happen. So for instance, there's a rule that you don't have to put a lifetime in self, but if there is any parameter returned that has a uh, that has a reference, it's going to have the same lifetime. Uh, but that's that. And otherwise, they are there. It's just you don't have to type those all those cases every time. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, also one clarification about, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, about a returning impulse trait is that, especially for people coming from more dynamic languages, it makes it look like you can return any type that implements that iterator. So, I mean, you can return any type, but it has to be the same type in all the branches that are returning from the function, right? Yeah, so once you return one uh, type, you cannot change the type. Uh, you cannot have one branch returning, I don't know, type A, and another branch returning type B, even if both of them implement iterator. Yeah, trait. yeah, that is that is a good point, and uh, it's of, often I run into this. Like for instance, you have uh, two ways to iterate an, an array, let's say, and in one branch you iterate one way, and the other the other way. They both return iterator, but they are two different iterators. And then Rust says, hold on, these two types are different, right? So they have different like byte sizes, they have different lengths, like in, in binary. So Rust cannot basically say, oh yeah, it's the same thing, which it isn't. So yeah, as I said, kind of they are effectively making a type anonymous so that it doesn't have a name, but it's one type. It's not, it cannot be more than one. Yes. 
And there is another thing I will talk about later, which lets you do exactly that, which is returning different types, but then it's using some dynamic features of the language, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But yeah, that's a good point, yes. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's go further. Um, deriving trait implementation. So, um, so yeah, so obviously you can implement traits by basically implementing some functions on those traits that are required to be implemented, but there are traits like, like debug, um, which are very handy. For instance, this record implements debug, uh, which allows, for instance, to it to be displayed like that um, using this kind of hash formatting string in the print line. And um, so it's recommended that basically any public uh, data type implements this because then it makes your life easier uh, as a developer. You can look what's in there and you know what's going on. And also they are debug is required for unwrapping of results um, for the error type because unwrap uses the debug output. Um, so obviously writing like this kind of implementation that prints like this text like that would be tedious. And so in Rust, we have something called um, a, a derived, um, uh, what you call it, um, kind of pragma thingy uh, for the compiler. So basically you in the derived, you list things that you want the compiler, you list basically the, the traits that you want the compiler to uh, derive for you. So it generates code uh, for you. So debug is the common one to use uh, to, to derive. And uh, the idea is that it implements the straight and also using the debug. Um, so all, all the fields of this record also has to implement the, the debug. But all those primitives and string in us do implement debug. So therefore, you can use debug to derive that. If one of those wouldn't, then you would have to derive, uh, you would have to implement debug uh, manually, which is not that hard, but it's just not something you want to do too often. The same goes with clone. The clone is one that basically makes a, a copy of a, of a value, but it's kind of a deep copy. So it copies, it, it, it expects all, every field of the record to also implement copy and we'll call cop, clone on, sorry, implant clone and call clone of every, on every field to make a clone of the whole record, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, some of these things cannot be, obviously not all the traits can be derived. Uh, they are not all trivial, right? So you can, for instance, partial, um, you can derive partial a Q, which basically means that the two things can, uh, two, two values can be compared with uh, double equals. Um, but for this instance, for the record, I am not deriving that, I am implementing that manually because I only, um, I can I can tell that two records are the same if their IPs are the same, because in theory, I should not have in the database two records of the same IP. So I basically skip having to check, especially those strings too much, right? I only check these four bytes uh, too, too much and I'm done checking, which is an optimization thing, let's say. Uh, also the same goes for ordering. Ordering, there's goes, in, um, there are basically two variants of equal and ordering. And basically the, the idea with the partial ones is that partial equal means, yeah, they can be compared, but they don't, they are not equal in a mathematic sense. They, they don't have all the properties of a mathematical equality. And then you can also derive uh, the EQ one, which, which basically you are saying, use this implementation but this also has a mathematical qualities. Like they can be, you know, all the rules apply uh, as in maths, not only um, like in the computer world and so. Uh, and then the partial order is the same idea. It's like um, partial order, you can order things, but not every um, two values can be uh, told if they are greater or equal or less than. Um, so that's why this function returns an option, which basically means it might be order, like the comparison, like the ordering between two values, it can be decided or not. Like for instance, uh, floats, like a floating point numbers, like F32 uh, primitive in Rust, um, does only implement the partial ord and doesn't implement the full ord. And the reason for that, that is that there can be a none value. And how do you order none versus something else, for instance, right? Versus a number. 
you, you can't because none is not a number, therefore they cannot be compared. Uh, so this is the reason why you have this kind of two versions of equal and or and also same. So for instance, uh, this is uh, useful in hash maps. This was basically created because of hash maps because the keys of the hash maps have to have a strict mathematical sense of quality and ordering has to always be um, actually our order yeah ordering is more like for b trees let's say right but the idea is that you cannot use uh, floats as indexes to hash maps because those values don't really um, don't really work very well for ordering and for equality does that make sense yeah okay so the other things i can see i deriving here are these two traits serialized and deserialized now i said that compiler derives these guys but these these ones are actually derived by a crate called serde so crate serde uh, contains a, a kind of let's say you could call it compiler plugin but uh, it's called procedural macro that is used to generate code for serialized and deserialized implement, uh, trait implementation. And effectively what it does, because there is a serialization library, this the record to be serialized with that library and deserialized with that library into binary stream and from binary stream. Um, and also they require that every field, if you want to derive serialized, every field also has to implement serialized, which all the, 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 the normal standard library types uh, do because they are implemented in the library itself. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this later, I guess. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, so you yeah. said uh, in order to derive that trait, all those uh, fields has to be implement has to implement that. Yes. But if if serialized and deserialized comes from Serde, uh, who implemented the Serde itself has to implement. Yes. Okay. Yeah, survey itself has implemented. Uh, so there is another, it's kind of off topic, but there's another rule. It's kind of called orphan rule in Rust. The idea is that if you define a trait, um, you can, like in your, mo you, your crate can implement that trait for any type, like from standard library. Um, uh, but if you were if, for instance, string wasn't implement wasn't implementing serialized for some reason because they forgot, let's say, you could not implement serialized for string in this crate because that would be con could potentially create conflicts later on. If, for instance, server decided, oh, well, we missed string, and now your code doesn't compile, so there's this kind of rule as well. But yeah, I mean, uh, usually when you when you have traits, in, um, they when you have um, crates that introduce different traits they usually tend to implement them for all the kind of common standard library types like primitives and strings and vectors and whatnot depending on what applies to what right and that's the case here as well thank you yeah one way to work around the uh, orphan rule which sometimes can be pretty useful as you said you know sometimes they forget to implement let's say is realized yeah. string is to use this new type pattern that uh, was mentioned before. So you could write, uh, you know, wrap string into your own type, uh, and it would be just, you know, struct uh, my string, which would have just, you know, string there, and then you could implement the foreign trait on your actually own type, even though your own type is just a, a thin wrapper around uh, some other. Type. yeah exactly yeah you can you can go crazy with that actually <laughs> i did in the past uh, but the idea is like yeah as you said for instance the db is just a wrap around the vector right but if i have some other library let's say let's say serda and the vector wasn't being doesn't implement serialized i can implement serialized for db still and uh, manually and uh yeah it can be yeah it can be used like that yes well, I cannot implement it for VEC, but I can still implement it for DB, which is fine. Uh, yeah, I think they, yeah, that, that's that. Um, okay, um, implementing custom error types. Uh, right, so uh, let's go, result type. So result type is um, another very handy standard library type. Uh, let me find some, that's what I did. Oh yeah, here. 
So, so this is a constructor that basically builds the DB using some data that just implement read. So basically that type, type you can read from it. Um, basically implements the read thread. Uh, and so the result type is uh, is an enum. Let me show you. Uh, so that's option, that's result. It's an enum which has two variants. One is OK and the other is R. And the OK type contains type T and R contains type E. So they can have two different, they can be of two different types, right? Depending on which variant you have. And this is basically used to handle um, kind of non-bug, kind of recoverable errors in Rust. So for instance, I can read the TSV data, right, from, from this reader, but what if it's not a properly formatted uh, TSV file, right? So this reading will fail. Um, and this function basically says you that, uh, yeah, you can construct DB, but it may fail. And if it, if it succeeds, it gives you an okay variant, which contains the, the constructed DB. And if it fails, it gives you the, the error um, variant, uh, the error variant containing the DB error um, type. So here you can see that I go through the file function and in the I say, uh, construct the okay variant for the DB. So also note that I don't, didn't have to go like result colon colon okay, because okay and error and some and none are imported uh, into prelude directly. So the variants themselves, uh, which is handy sometimes. You can sometimes do it for your own types if you have to use a lot of variants in that function. Uh, so yeah, so that's the, the main mechanism. Basically you use the result and then the result has lots of handy functions like uh, give me, you know, if they can be chained together, like if this was okay. Uh, if this wasn't okay, maybe try this, or if this was okay, and this then change this, and if that was okay as well, then it's all okay, etc. So this 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 functions you you know when you use Rust a lot, you will remember it by heart what they do, and I recommend you to in investigate every one of them, including transpose, which I found super useful. I was really waiting for it to be implemented, but I'm not gonna explain it because it's fun, uh, fun one uh, for you to to look into. Um, but yeah, basically, um, you then access values using one of those um, methods, or you basically just use match uh, pattern uh, pattern matching to the structure, um, and you know it, it takes different code path if it was okay or not. Uh, so going back, um, the other thing that you usually want to so 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 basically the error types um, are those that go into the second var type variable in of, of result. And the error types, uh, they can be anything, but in practice, there are usually enums, which uh, then uh, go into which actual error happened because like, you know, say DB, where was this DB error? DB error can be like problem reading TSV or maybe the, there was an IO error or maybe there was a bin encoding error of the serialized format or something like that. So there can be different um, kind of variants of this error that happened, and then you can act on them. Like for instance, you try to open a, a file and it return your db error file error. Then you may want to try another file, for instance, right? Um, so you can handle errors by accessing details of the variant. But they, uh, but uh, those types can be anything. They can be tuples, numbers, or uh, they often structs. Like in standard library, uh, structs are used when there are some common fields that are common to all their kind, kind of kinds. And then there is this function called kind, which gives you an enum with which variant was it. Uh, so for instance, like if there's a wrapper in a C library, you will have error, error no number and maybe description, which every library in C would have set for you. But then there will be kind uh, um, enum that you can ask for uh, from the error type to, to give you more details. Was it like permission denied or broken pipe or whatever. So does that. Um, then uh, standard library defines um, a trait called error, which is used across the standard library, and it's recommended to implement for um, error types, but it's not necessary per se. It's not a requirement. And there are some libraries that provide their own traits for error types for various reasons and purposes. But I generally tend to go with the standard library error and the, the only thing you need to implement for error, uh, let's see if I have it open somewhere here. 
Maybe not. Mm, let's try, let's try this. The only th you don't need to implement. Uh, um, what was it? Let me just show you what it has. Yeah. So it only on, on, has this 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 methods, but you can see that all of them are um, they have different implementation. The only thing you do need though is for error to be implementable, the 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 type needs to implement both debug and display. Right. So debug, as I said, is usually the right, but display um, is a different thing. You have to implement yourself. Uh, there are some crates that help you with that, but generally I'm going to go with that. Uh, so display is um, it's basically like debug for, for 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 showing a message, but it's a message that would be shown in a UI or or in a in a nice kind of user facing way rather than debug, which is more geared towards the developer when program crashed, then it has some debug stuff in it. But when the program failed because you gave it the wrong file to read, then it gives you the nice kind of you know, string saying, oh, um, error opening database file or whatever, right? So you do have to implement that. And to implement that, you implement just one uh, function. And then for error, you don't have to implement any. You just say implement an empty bracket. But if you happen to keep um, actual errors that cause your db error so it can be caused by a tsv parser or by another io error or by bico error then you can use source uh, you can implement that to to uh, to chain together uh, your error with the causes of it uh, which can be useful uh, in cases like if you want to display a full message like uh, i could not open the db file uh, colon um, you know uh, IO error, I don't, permission denied, or something like that. Um, if you want to kind of follow the chain, um, the error trait provides this mechanism for the source uh, method. It used to have description, it's now obsolete, and there is some other stuff. You know, but there's you know, experimental things, but the, the technical things as well. Um, so that's that. Um, the other part of the error handling kind of spectrum in Rust is the from trait. So from trait in itself is very universal. So because Rust is uh, statically typed, it, you know, every type has to match uh, on every um, binding. So um, from is a, is, a, is a trait that allows you to define a kind of common standard way of converting white to one type to another, but only in the cases where this conversion cannot fail. It always have to Fine. There is another one called try from, which may fail because it returns a result, but that's that's not not an encoder. So uh, from is very uh, useful in case of errors because it allows you to construct your error type from the other error type, right? So if I have TSV parse error, I can construct this TSV error variant of it. If I have an IO error, I construct the file error. So there is another kind of wrapper type I use here to add the context in, in a way of a static string, which uh, I may explain later, but it's not important. Uh, now, when you have these things, like the, usually I go like this debug, um, display, uh, error, which can be empty, uh, and from relevant to, error, to each of those types here. When you have that, um, which you also to note, there are many, many, many crates that can generate this for you from some annotation magic, um, which I used before, I now don't use, but I don't. Uh, when you have that, you can use the question mark operator. I mean, I don't think you have, you need to have the, the error one, but from you would need to have uh, to make it use of it. So the question mark operator is a kind of a syntactic sugar thinking in Rust. Um, it used to be actually a macro, but then they made it into a syntax uh, form of question mark. And the idea is that um, whatever this thing, if this thing is a result, like so write a result in an IO error, I, I add this context thinking to it saying, well, have what right, right is wrong. Then you can un unwrap the OK variant. So this expression will be equal to whatever the write there. I think write gives you a number of bytes, which I don't use. So I don't assign it to any, don't, don't bind it to any variable. But 
in general, it gives you the, the value of the OK variant if everything went well, or it returns from your function with an error variant. But with a twist, it also calls a from uh, conversion on it so that it can be converted into the, the return type. So as you can see, this write will probably give you an IO error. But because there is a conversion from IO error to DB error with the from trait I've implemented above, then the question mark will work and it will automatically give you a proper variant of DB error. Now, how's that useful? I think it's very useful because it just makes you know error handling is like try do this, 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 and give me those values. If there's any problem, just fill out. It's basically for uh, bubbling up the errors, uh, the color effectively, uh, without having to worry about them too much. Now, this do you can you follow this? Yeah. All right. So that's kind of like one of my favorite aspects of Rust because you know every function that can fail with whatever it can fail and when it can fail. So it's no like unlike Java where it's throwing exceptions left and right and you have these checks, exceptions, etc. But in general it's more clear what what's gonna happen by just looking at the uh, the um, the definition of function right at this head of it. Okay. Um, iterators. So now so I talked a bit about option type, but with iterators it's it's kind of essence of it, let's say. Um, iterators are basically a way to uh, enumerate some elements of an array, for instance, and basically to write loops in a, in a composable and abstract way, right? So um, in, uh, in languages like C, um, you don't have iterators. You have, well, C++ you do as well, but uh, Usually you would be just writing a for loop and then give it those indexes and they go there and they do some access to something and then you go out of bound and then you have a CVE and then you have hard bleed and everybody crying, right? So iterators prevent this from happening by basically not letting you do the map, but creating some abstractions that and do the map for you and let, let them be composed together to give you, for you to basically be able to build any possible loop you may ever want, uh, which is sometimes tricky, but it's kind of like a mini puzzle in, in Rust for me to, uh, you know, to describe the loop with an iterator and it usually pays off uh, by it being more readable, hopefully, and also kind of more comp composable. You can also return iterators and uh, which is something really crazy concept, but, it just, but you cannot return like for loops, right? Um, so this gives you that extra thing. So option type as well, as I said, is kind of essence of it. The idea with option type is that it represents a value or or none. So it's like a, a, a null kind of thing in other languages. So Rust doesn't have nulls. If you want to have something that may not have a value, then you use option of that type T, right? And if it has a value, then it has a sum variant containing that value, or if it doesn't has known variant and it doesn't contain any. Uh, and then also there's a bunch of uh, functions that lets you chain them together, convert them into resolve and iterators even, and uh, get, you know, uh, unwrapping the value and crushing the program. Otherwise there's transpose as well. And, you know, there are other different things you will be, I'm not gonna go into this, but this is another talk <laughs> effectively, but you will be familiar very quickly when you use Rust. So going back to iterator, so iterator, the idea with iterator is that there's only one required method on it. And that required method is called next. And takes a mutable reference to self, which means it allows the iterator structure or the, the data behind the iterator, the state of it to be mutated every time you call it. And then it returns an option of the items that it pro produces, right? So if you have an iterator of a vector of um, of records like like this, so you can iterate a vector, then the, the next will return an option of a record. And the idea here is that if, until the iterator gives you some records, right? So the variant some with a record, then you can continue calling next and it gives you the next, the next and the next one. But once it returns none, that iterator has run out of uh, items to iterate. 
and then you should stop calling next. Um, uh, so that's basically how it works, and this is basically called. Um, so this is basically called. Um, actually, I don't have it. But the, the idea is that this is called an external iteration, and ver uh, so external iteration like that's also used in Java, for instance, where you have the has next method and next, uh, but you have two methods there, and and Rust using option type basically makes it a one method. And in Java, you have to have has next because there is nothing like option, uh, so you could not otherwise tell if the next actually give you something or not. Uh, so it's more elegant, elegant than that, and also this allows you to um, nicely compose iterators, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But um, another note is that, for instance, Ruby uses internal iterators by default, which basically are iterators that take a block of code, which get an item passed into it for each item. Uh, but I, as far as, uh, as I'm aware, uh, they try that in Rust initially, and they run into composability issues, uh, especially with the, the lifetimes and everything involved in the type system, like statically typed language like Rust. So they went with this um, external iteration instead. Um, so uh, iterators are composable. So every iterator has black kind of default implementations uh, for this method that can um, that you can use on an iterator. So the simple one is uh, like count will basically consume the whole iterator and give you the number of elements it managed to to iterate with next, right? Uh, and also, I need to note that uh, in, in Rust, iterators are lazy, but this is actually eager, right? This one is eager. But if you use map, which basically lets you give a, a closure to change the item that is iterating based on the, the, the item it, it already has. So it take, gets one item and returns another item, which becomes um, becomes an iterator. So map implements, it's an iterator. Uh, and this iterator will give you items of the original iterator of type f, right? But passed through this closure, and it gives you the item of that closure, so it gives you the the, the kind of beauty. Um, so this is this is lazy, right? So you can you can map you know this one and filter and some others that are lazy, and then uh, in the end you call like uh, for each or count or last or whatever, and this will kind of consume the iterator uh, to, to to the last element. Is that clear? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, there's another concept here I, I would introduce um, called zero cost abstraction. So uh, this is zero cost abstraction as defined uh, by an author of C++, which basically means that uh, when you use, in, in context of iterators, you could say when you use iterators, um, then you don't pay any extra performance costs uh, compared to if you would hand roll the same loop uh, that the iterator represents. It should basically end up as the same assembly uh, in principle. I say in principle because I know there are some edge cases which require some special features which was never thought, uh, but it's very rare. I mean, it's some cases there are documents as well. But in general, if you use iterator like, um, you know, like this one, which is like it filters something, then it maps things, and then it does like flat map and other stuff. Um, if you write this this beast as a one giant loop, then it will be as fast as this iterator, or not slower than, um, not faster than this iterator is. So that's that's the idea. And basically, all these iterators in the standard library are kind of carefully structured in such a way that they yield to compiler optimizations very well. And that's the magic sauce there. Okay. So um, how you construct iterators? There is an into iterator trait that um, many types implement. For instance, vector would implement uh, into iterator. So you can call dot into iterator. And now we have an iterator of all elements that the vector contains. Uh, hash map implements into iterator, but it will give you uh, a, a tuples of key value pairs, for instance. But hash map can also give you other iterators like only values or etc. But the inter iterator is the one that is used for for loops, which I don't have an example of here because I tend not to use for loops um, that much. 
but the idea is that um, if you give a vector into a for loop, then it will call into iterator to co construct an iterator for for you, kind of like a synthetic sugar thing. Uh, so that's that. You can also have into iterator implemented on on uh, references to vector. If you have a reference to vector and you call into iterator, you're gonna iterate the reference uh, the references to every element of a vector, and you want and your vector will be kept in place because otherwise it will be consumed and all the items you will get uh, would effectively destroy the vector. So that's that. Uh, the other way around is the from iterator, which is also implemented for collections like VEC, which can basically let uh, you to, to call methods like collect that would construct uh, on an iterator that would construct the collection from the elements of the iterator. So if you have an iterator of prime numbers, uh, I don't know, up to some number, and then you go collect into vector, then you get a vector of all those numbers, right? And also hash map and other um, containers in standard library implement that. For instance, you, you can create a hash map by uh, iter con con consuming an iterator of tuples, uh, key value pairs. Just go ahead. And so one thing to note is that turbofish, <laughs> which is a funny name, Uh, where is it? Mm. Which is useful with the collect one. Um, let me see if I can find it. Mm. Oh, yeah, here. So, what I do here, so this read ASN TSV returns an iterator, right? Uh, that's that pre function there. I called collect, and this is this turbo fish syntax. So, it's like double uh, column and then opening and closing bracket. This lets you put a type that would go uh, to parameterize the collect function or the method in this case. Um, you could also use put the type uh, on this variable just to call on and then it would be equivalent, but I tend to use this and some people have some opinions on this apparently. Um, and as anyway, this basically says collect um, this iterator into a result containing either a vector or some error, uh, which is quite a, a handy one, uh, which basically means that if you remember this iterator, um, which is here, the, every item is a result of a record or TSV parser, every item. So it's not that the whole, the whole, the whole iterator, you always get an iterator, but each item may be an error uh, because each line that the, the CSV parser processes through the file may not parse. Um, so in order to just get one result of whole parsing operation and the vector of those records that get out of this, you can collect into a result and then into something that implements from iterator as well. Uh, so that's a kind of tricky bit. And you can notice that you don't always have to specify types in Rust uh, and let them to be inferred, which is perfectly inferable from the signature of this function. Does that make sense? Yep. Sorry, guys, I'm kind of losing voice. Uh, but as I said, it's been um, a bit long. Uh, uh, a few more slides. Um, I don't know if you want to have a break or we continue. What do you reckon? I'm fine to continue, by the way. I think we can continue and finish it. Okay, yeah. cool. What you know, everyone thinks. Feel free to stop me or drop out. I um, you know it's been a big long <laughs> one, but yeah, that was the intention of all this. Okay, so quickly, CSV parsing. So you've seen a lot of this happening um, already. Uh, all right, do this here. So CSV is a crate created by Bern Sushi, which is kind of famous person in Rust. He created the rip, rip, uh, rip grep, which is a, a grep rep replacement and the regex engine for Rust. Um, so he created also the CSV library um, or crate, and, and it can let you parse CSVs and TSVs and all the related formats, right? So Rust uses this. Um, so because Rust doesn't have a default arguments and it doesn't have them by a kind of design, really. I know many people would love to see having them, but there's been a strong opposition not to include them because Rust is basically aiming for explicit kind of making everything explicit in the code, right? Uh, which kind of default parameters defeat that in uh, in some sense. Uh, Rust instead of you know if you if you have to create like a CSV reader 
like an object which can parse an arbitrary CSV or DSV, or you would have to pass a lot of options to it. It's like, what's the delimiter? Does it have header uh, line or, you know, or does it quote things or what's the escape for the quotes or is there a scale, etc. right? So um, uh, Rust, uh, in this case, in Rust, you would be want to uh, think about using a builder pattern. The builder pattern is basically, um, it's basically uh, when you have uh, another type, which is named the same type as the one you are trying to, to construct, like to build, but has a builder in the name, uh, it's a convention, right? And then you basically create those builders um, with a new um, or default or, you know, usually new, and then um, you call functions in this kind of fluent way. So this function returns an, uh, a builder that has delimiter configured, and this function returns a builder that has a delimiter configured and that has headers set to false, etc. And in the end, you call a function that returns you the original thing you were building, which is the reader. So from reader gives you this um, source of the data for, for the CSV reader and constructs the reader. So R RDR is actually a type uh, CSV reader. Uh, so the builder is gone and its only purpose is to construct um, your object uh, by giving, by, by having some defaults initially set and letting you override those with functions uh, or methods to call such. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what I find about interesting about the uh, builder pattern is uh, so normally <clears throat> uh, you the functions in Rust doesn't have default values. So uh, let's say if you want the builder reader with a constructor with the new, uh, the arguments for the new cannot have uh, default values. So the yeah. way that you do is you can, instead of using the directly the values, you can use option. But yes. in this pattern, you don't need to use that. It's kind of like you delegate those kind of assigning default values to this builder yeah. uh, object or builder thingy. And uh, it creates reader with the default values that you haven't assigned yet. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could imagine that the builder, reader builder is a struct that has the same fields as the, the reader, but they all are options and only set by these functions. And when you construct all those nonce are replaced with some defaults. Yeah, something like this. Um, or they are set as defaults in the say in the first place, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's basically a way to, mm, to not have to write every you know default thing over and over. There is, by the way, a default trait in Rust, uh, which is used by things like hash maps, etc., and uh, with the purpose of having a default constructor, and it can be handy for this kind of stuff. Like, uh, um, but yeah, and also as you say, uh, you can also pass an option to uh, as an argument to a function. Which way, when you say none, then it's using some default, right? Um, also, there is some conversion between a value to an option. So you can basically say, um, uh, I don't know, I want something to be number three. And you just say three instead of some three, and it gets converted into option of three. There are different tricks around this. Um, but builder pattern is, 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 is kind of standard in Rust, I would say, um, to do these things. Okay, so um, yeah, also, as I mentioned before, the, the IO in Rust is basically um, a standard library IO is based on the blocking IO. So there's no like uh, asynchronous stuff in it by default. Um, and it's been like obviously there for from the beginning. Uh, and there, there are three the straight read uh, allows you to read any bytes uh, from anything that implements them basically. And many things implement read, as I said, can be a file, open file, or it can be um, an open socket, or it can be a string. Uh, I think it can be string, maybe in a string in a, a vector of bytes in wrapped in a, uh, what you call it, a cursor. So that kind of, it kind of can read. So cursor implements read as well. So you can, you can read memory, you can read files, etc. So this is pretty handy. So Basically, what builder um, expects uh, it has this from reader, which basically takes any any source of data. 
um, which is very handy. You can, you know, you can have a request on the socket uh, on the HTTP and then return a body, which is a widget, something like that, which is gonna be fetched uh, uh, kind of as if, you know, as, as the reader progresses reading, right? That's a kind of powerful thing. And that was kind of sign out. So serialization, uh, so as I noticed uh, before, um, when you read, uh, right, so when you read, um, you can deserialize from anything implementing read and you can serialize for anything implementing write because uh, serialization is basically an, an, an act of changing uh, some structure into some binary form that can be transported over wire, for instance, and read on the other end or written to a file and then read later. Um, and so uh, Rust has a Rust ecosystem basically mostly settled on uh, a Cerda library or Cerda crate that as a kind of standard for serialization. And there was one before it and there are probably others, but Cerda is kind of golden standard. And um, um, Cerda basically implements serializations for tons of stuff. Um, so it has, you know, a bunch of different formats and probably more than that. Uh, you can even serialize the environment variables from, well, the serialization, one, but still it's weird. But, you know, you have JSON, which is well supported, and uh, C, C board, and I use Bing code, which is, uh, I don't know, I think I use here. I um, find it to be fast. The, the problem that this library solves with serialization is reading this, the, um, this CSV or uh, kind of tab separated file is actually slow because you know it's multiple megabytes and it's text to be parsed and processed. Well, it takes probably like you know half a second or something. But for the command like line utility like uh, SN lookup, I don't want to wait half a second. I just want to run a command and get the answer, right? Also, if um, and it has to read the database from scratch every time you run it because it's not loaded in memory. It's just something that it has to open every time you run. So the workaround for this I found was basically to load this um, TSV into this kind of vector of records, you know, sort them and prepare them for lookup and then write them using store um, uh, into this sprite uh, using serials into from the bin code library, which basically can serialize anything that implements ser the serialize which uh, we know that record does, right? And then basically what I do when I run this, when you run this uh, ASN lookup command, it basically goes and deserializes that vector of records uh, using this, um, and it's been called a back by basically checking that the tags are present and then, sorry, let's see, and then doing the deserialize. And this bin code format is much, much faster than to load than the TSP. And also I did all the sorting, I did all the, the you know, uh, I only have all the fields that I need and they are in the format I need, uh, which is a bit different from the original file. So that's basically that. So I guess I, I spoke a lot uh, already on this, uh, but there is much more to it. You can have some annotations of fields and you can control the structure and the names and you can serialize enums in JSON, and there's like it's very powerful library, and you can do a lot of things uh, for you. Uh, okay, uh, panics. So I think not that much for uh, panics. Uh, so I wanted to mention, uh, although I'm not using this, but this is in case uh, which may happen here. So in the Rust. Uh, Error handling in Rust is split into two kind of categories. Uh, one is the normal errors that can happen at runtime, which are handled by the program in some graceful way, even if it's exiting with error message. And the kind of other problems that can happen uh, because the program has bugs or because uh, the, the system ran out of memory or something that basically is not supposed to be handled by the program. It's supposed to basically crash the program in the most graceful way possible and report it to, to the developer effectively. So using the debug output uh, so that the user can basically say, oh, this thing crashed. But the difference between crashing in C 
with Sackfold and, and Rust is that Rust has a nice graceful uh, crash when it basically calls the destructors on the way on the stack frame kind of path, um, making sure that if there was an open file, it's gonna get closed, and it's gonna get flushed buffers. If there was an open socket, it's closed, etc. Right? So, um, so this is more like throwing an exception in Java um, than crashing like in C. Um, you can configure it to crash like in C, like with basically going abort uh, if you want. And this saves a lot of binary size usually because you don't have all this unwinding code responsible for releasing things and calling destructors. Uh, and some, there might be some good, like for a command line program, I mean, it might be a good way to handle things uh, if you want, but uh, it's a configuration and it's not a diff. So, uh, so there are two ways to panic. One is, well, two ways. Generally, you panic with calling a macro called panic, which you can give a formatted string, and the same way like you do with um, with println, which lets you to print the standard output, and uh, then the program goes into unwind, um, dropping you know all the things on the stack and and exiting with a panic. But you can get a panic as well from some methods that do panic. And most notably, what panics is the index operator. If we find some example. So, for instance, um, you know, the zero is that vector in the DB. Um, if you if you would uh, give it an index that exceeds that, um, or is I, I don't think you can have a minus one index because it's all I think unsigned integers. But anyway, if you give it a, a out of bound one. It will panic. It will crash your program. So this is considered, you know, like out of bounds exception in Java. So in Rust, is considered an unrecoverable, fatal bug kind of error thingy. Where in Java, you can just catch it and continue on, like never, you know, hap nothing happened, right? Um, so that's basically the difference in philosophy. The idea here is that um, if, for instance, I used to run Java servers uh, in my work. And they sometimes go out of memory exception, and that out of memory takes off some thread. Um, but you know, site is still there. I mean, it works, right? Apart from some critical functionality, like some background job is not working because its thread is dead. But it's like, oh, well. Uh, so you can get these zombie state programs by allowing these kind of exceptions to be caught. Where in Rust, it's just saying, oh well, if you access out of bounds, then your logic is wrong. In the program, it's a program issue. It's a developer has to look into it and basically call crash. That's it. So it's kind of you know crash say crash or fail fast kind of approach. But uh, obviously, like with exception, you have to make libraries to be safe, like panic safe. Same like exception safe. The idea is that if you have some um, a library that uses some unsafe code, you want to make sure that uh, panic flying through. Uh, its stack uh, does not let, leave it in some uh, inconsistent state that a destructor could, you know, observe, for instance, or any other part of the code could observe, actually. So this is a tricky bit, and it's probably hard in practice, but uh, I know that the library, you know, has been carefully programmed to be panic safe, so that if you, you know, uh, it, it, if you don't run into undefined behavior, if you catch the panic. You can also catch the panic, but it's not recommended in general case. If you catch the panic, you don't get into undefined behavior. Okay, um, let's keep going. Um, maybe we can finish this. <laughs> so um, testing. So every um, at the end of the file, the modules, you can have module kind of unit tests, which I sometimes do. Um, uh, basically, it's another module we define with um, mod keywords. So Modules, you can have files. Uh, if you create a new file .rs in your direct, you know, like source directory, it will be a module. But you can also introduce modules with a mod keyword inside the files themselves. But it's only, I mean, I'm usually only doing that for tests. And the name is irrelevant, but usually it's test per convention. And you can see that there is a config compiler flag saying that compile this only if the tests were in testing, right? So this code is not included in the release or in the runtime thing. Um, so because this is another module, it has to import um, stuff to use, but uh, you can use super to basically say, import everything from the parent module. 
um, which is handy for tests. You can just do this, and um, it's not recommended to use that in the real modules because you import in star, it can be sometimes difficult to, to know what you actually imported. But here you want to test what's in that file, so it's kind of grand. Um, and you can import other stuff that you don't import uh, in normal program, which I, for instance, use a temp file. I will attempt you to create some temporary file for testing, like the database, right? For instance, right? And the idea with tests is that you can have as many functions. <coughs> Sorry, losing voice. Functions that are marked as test and they will be executed. Um, and if they if they don't if they success success if they don't panic then they are successful. If they panic then the test failed. Also, they can return the result. Uh, if return if they return okay, then they are passed and are uh, then they fail, right? Uh, the note on this: you can run them uh, basically by running. You know, as you can see here, so uh, it does run this um, libres test. And is this oh, that's from doc section from documentation. This is the test. The test DB. The test modules test db function right and it's okay if i had more of them uh, which you can uh, then those will be run in parallel so which means that they all be executed at the same time on different threads and better your program be thread safe <laughs> so i mean rust obviously um, is thread safe by default but if you're using c libraries in the in the back and they are not thread safe um, then your test may catch that and I have this experience with um, GIP library from MaxMind, uh, which there was a proper core in Rust, which I updated with some extra functionality and it started crashing in tests. And I was like, whoa, what the hell is going on? And then yes, it's not thread safe, that library. So I had to wrap it in some mutex. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so just going back to this command line applications, we are not far from the end. Um, right, so this was the library part. I'm not gonna go obviously that with the details over the, the command lines, but uh, basically, yeah, what we need is three. So command lines have the same kind of structure with the cargo. So you can see that uh, I'm using ASNDB here as a dependency. And apart from that, uh, the only difference usually is that the source contains a bin folder. And in that bin, there are uh, files that will compile as binaries. And so if you will look at the one of them, um, so this will create two binaries, the ASN lookup and ASN update. So the update one is basically responsible for downloading the, the, T, the DB file from that uh, IP to ASN website uh, using HTTP get, right? And uh, to convert it into the um, serialized form stored in a file on the local disk so that the, the lookup one can use it to do the actual lookups. So the main thing about the main thing about the binaries is that they have main function, right? So the main function um, in Rust usually doesn't return anything, but it might return a result. So this is an alias to result that I have. Um, it's not important, but the idea is that, um, yeah, that if you have a result, then if you go okay, then it will exit with zero, and otherwise will exit with something non-zero, and basically print you a, a, a debugging string. So you can, I, I use this, um, Final result from my other crate, which I called Cotton, which contains some kind of prelude for me to make writing scripts kind of more easy for for, for my own stuff. Is I may I may want to release that at some stage, but it's <coughs> basically bug of stuff that I keep using often, you know. So anyway, but the main is the same. I can see a bit uh, kind of return. Thinking features. I'm not sure actually for status codes. Um, you can read about that later. <coughs> the only, the other thing that uh, you notice is you don't get the argv here, like in C. You can access arguments using. Uh, I think it's argv. Mock parts. 
there is an environment that gives yeah you can call a function and you get arguments well obviously you get <coughs> you get an iterator over strings but i would not recommend that uh, unless it's a very trivial case um i would recommend you you know especially if you need to handle some flags and arguments to use um some other things also there is um there is an env uh, actually it is in the module uh, there is env um like var i think you can uh, yeah you can get environment variables like home right uh which one of the thing that binaries usually get um, to get okay um so parsing command line arguments is probably the first thing you're gonna want to do um and rust has this um the library that or the crate that has become also kind of almost the facto standard maybe not as strong as as Serde, but well known it's called clap and clap has this kind of builder syntax uh, for creating uh, command line parsers which then in turn uh, gener uh, can be used to generate a help uh, uh, kind of text for minus minus help um, and also can be used to basically parse things into and verify the variables into some sort of a, um, things you can get from it later on but <clears throat> since then uh, someone uh, created something called struktoft and it's um, it's another kind of trait that you can derive <clears throat> so it implements uh, this uh, procedural macro behind it that basically derives a clap a builder kind of thinky from your actual struct that you want to get from parsing the arguments so this is super nice because then you can only say okay my cli parameters i want something to control logging which i have defined somewhere else i want to have a, a database cache path which can be optional uh, and it will take a, a path and i say you can access it via a long parameter like minus minus database minus cache minus path which will be automatically generated from this and here I want to have something that is either URL or file and it's going to be called um, CSV location and it has a default value which well, defaults to this URL, right? So as you can see, it's very kind of like declarative in fashion. And what you get is basically, uh, you basically call this and you can get, you get the arguments. You get this struct with these fields as they are, which is really, really cool. Uh, and if you if you pass the wrong arguments it will give you an error message and automatically quit main and i don't know if i can show this update for instance it also produces this output for you automatically so you can annotate this with with the documentation and this documentation kind of string uh, comments will be used here uh, and here right so you get all this stuff just from this annotation. So I think this is super awesome mm. way of doing things. Uh, mm, yeah, any questions on that? I guess uh, as a note, uh, the URL or file um, you, you can you can you can uh, you can get it to kind of. Uh, parse an argument uh, to any of your types if you implement from um, trait, which is kind of standard library one. And this way you can kind of patch more things into it. You can support modules and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Okay, let's 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 get down with this. Um, so uh, also you get access to standard input and output um, uh, as you do normally with programs. Um, I don't know if I have one. Actually, I have it on the other one. Um, so lookup, for instance, will um, can read from standard input. Uh, let me see where I have it. Uh, actually, that must be here. So this is a bit complicated. Yeah. So see this um, the reader builder. When I read here, I actually read not the the not the database file, but the list of IPs in, TS, in CSV format. So I can just 
pipe some CSV into it uh, and get a resolved records out of that. And I basically use uh, IOS to the in as a, a reader to read from. It's like reading from file. And same is like you, you, you also, so for the output, you can use uh, printLN uh, and you can also use a, a, a log library, log crate, which is also kind of standard, which defines macros for logging errors like errors, debug, um, uh, you know, info, uh, warn, this kind of log levels. And then there is another crate that handles this, so like an implementation gut of it that can handle printing that on the screen that you can choose between. So one log crate is kind of an interface and then you can have multiple implementations doing actual printing. Is that all cool? Oh, well, we have nobody left actually. That was too long. <laughs> Anyway, let's yeah, keep going. A lot of ground to cover. Yeah, that's maybe too much for one presentation. Anyway, let's finish this. It's not much left. Dynamic types. Uh, um, yeah, I just want to show this because that's what uh, Vlad mentioned before. Uh, um, sometimes you want to read like here, I want to read the URL or a file, right? So depending on what I have, if it's a URL file, but uh, I want to get a reader, like just a, a type, but uh, this would be two different types because one would be a file and the other would be a, a, a body from a fetch. So you can use a kind of box din to basically say, this is like um, a virtual function calls. So this basically, converts it into stack, uh, allocates uh, these objects of different sizes, depending on the which half it takes on a heap, uh, but gives you a single kind of fat pointer uh, that will route uh, calls to the read methods to the correct type, depending on which it is on the runtime. So it's also a zero cost similar to, to tables. Okay, that's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I will stop recording.